All right. Uh, we'll start since uh, it's already 631. Sige, I invite everybody for a short prayer before we start our meeting. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Graciously loving Father, we thank you, Lord, for the abundant blessings you have poured into our lives. May it be the people, may it be the friends, may it be opportunities, and may it be the challenges. May they continue to fill our hearts with purpose. And allow us, Lord, to be driven towards you. May everything we do glorify you, Lord. This we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. John Baptist de La Salle, pray for, pray for us. us. With Jesus in our hearts. For our Lord. the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. All right. So uh, we proceed with um, learning the basics on our chapters, uh, I'm sorry, it's the very start of uh, here, Republic Act 386 or otherwise known as the Civil Code of the Philippines, right? So as a concept, the different sources of our civil code would come from, again, from Spain, um, the 1935 constitutions, the different organic laws during then, remember that we often have, during this, uh, apart from the existence of the um, Civil Code of Spain, um, there were statutes that were issued by the Crown to different colonies. So these organic laws be also be considered as sources of our Civil Code. We also have different rules of court, whether it is local and foreign decisions from uh, the Supreme Court, which is part of our jurisprudence. We also may adopt uh, foreign or should we say general concepts of law through different foreign tribunals. Uh, say for instance, uh, influences coming from the United Nations, coming from various uh, organs that uh, define international relations. Customs, traditions of the people may also be the basis of our civil code. Later on, um, we would discover that even customs and traditions can be very well be the source of our uh, civil laws. And then general principles of law and equity, these are usually uh, standards and sets of which we uh, we abide to and then more particularly uh, mga cultural aspects niya. so ideas coming from the code commission itself uh, later on there is a narrative on the what the code commission was able to accomplish and then their composition but uh, just be familiar with them okay Next is um, be more or less familiar with uh, here. There's a narration that in uh, the principal basis of the Civil Code of Spain, which became effective in the Philippines, uh, either on December 7, 1889, or the, the correct date, it would seem, was December 7, 1889, uh, 20 days after its public publication in Gaceta de Manila, on November 17. So, of course, we root again ourselves to the uh, Spanish Civil Code. And uh, during that time, it had four, ti uh, four, four titles. Ah, sorry, more than four titles. Para. Uh, it had various uh, coverages. So titles 4 and 12, however, of Book 1 of the Civil Code, were never applied for the application in the Philippines and was suspended by reason that um, it only applied to the mainland na, na provision. And the gaps between the colonial uh, um, different colonies of Spain, uh, they had their own separate uh, laws to fill, fill those uh, I don't know, siya, gaps. So among the famous commentators, we have Manresa, Justice Manresa, who is uh, from Spain. 
the one where we were trying to define um, civil law, which is uh, rule of conduct, which is, which is just and obligatory. Uh, it came from Felipe Sanchez Roman, who is one of the pillars and founders of uh, the study of civil law. Then um, these individuals, such as uh, Calixto Valverde, uh, sila ni sila ang ginabasihan kung kis uh, kung you are rooting the history and the reason why this certain provision exists. Okay. Others, well, of course, from equal to the prominence of our Spanish civil code, were the French civil code, or coming from the uh, Napoleon laws that were promulgated during the time of uh, uh, Napoleon um, through the different uh, correspondence. We also use that as a basis. Technically, it was used as a basis by the uh, authors of the Spanish Civil Code and we adopted the Spanish Civil Code. So the brief history of our civil laws, uh, prior to the present civil law, we had, again, the application of the old civil code, which is the Civil Code of Spain. Prior to the Civil Code of Spain, our civil laws was founded in Recopilacion de Leyes de las Indias, which is the following uh, compositions. Uh, we had the latest Spanish laws enacted for the colonies, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, lo, uh, la Novisima Recopilacion, La Nueva Recopilacion, the Royal Ordinances of Castile, Leyes de Toro or Laws of Toro. These are, uh, yeah, the other one is the Siete Partidas, which is also one of the, if you've heard Siete Partidas, this is also like, like a Magna Carta of different laws entitling different citizens. So uh, those were very much prominent as uh, how we had the origin of the Spanish Civil Code. So we focus on the sources of Philippine civil law. Um, more importantly, the current one that we have have been greatly influenced by the 1935 and the 1973 Philippine Constitution respectively. Um, and then if you would also think about it, uh, our civil code took effect in 1950. So even before the effectivity of the 1973, it's predominantly coming from the Spanish civil code. So we had uh, um, the very foundations such as the Supreme Court ruled that there were no more obstacles to the effectivity of the 1973 constitution. And therefore we had like creating a new present constitution that, that gave way to the present constitution because prior to our 1987 constitution, we sort of had a freedom or revolutionary and provisional constitution, meaning the freedom constitution was then a byproduct of uh, people power and it was temporarily constituted to legitimize back then the, uh, the said EDSA revolution. Now, we also have statutes. These are the laws being promulgated by our legislatures, presidential decrees or executive orders. These are vested to the powers of the executive having the force and effect of statutes, administrative or general orders in so far as they are not contrary to the laws of the constitution, laws or to the constitution. We also have with us Customs of the place provided they are not contrary to existing, they are not contrary to existing laws, public order, or public policy. We have judicial decisions, uh, which again, part of our jurisprudence. Um, the judicial customs, where decisions are made notwithstanding the absence of applicable statutes or customs. Because uh, if you've heard the common term of judicial legislation, um, there are instances wherein a particular law is being interpreted. You all very well know that the function of the judiciary is to interpret our laws and at the same time render some effectivity towards it, whether there is doubt to its application or not. But in certain instances, 
there are, well, in the history of jurisprudence, there are instances wherein the Supreme Court would create its own rules uh, through the promulgated decisions uh, despite the fact that there is no existing law during that time. So that is where the term the judicial legislation would come in, where it's not the legislative who's trying to create the law, but it is the judiciary through the promulgated decisions. So decisions of foreign courts may be used, uh, principles covering analogous cases wherein if it applies here in our country or previously cases, um, American jurisprudence were also being used, principles of leg legal hermeotics or statutory construction. Um, a basic thing about statutory construction is that when a provision of law is capable of two or more interpretation, then legal hermeotics is actually being applied. So in the study of law, uh, statutory construction is, I believe, just a one unit subject wherein it allows the law students to actually uh, have methods and means of trying to decipher or at least find a structured approach in trying to uh, interpret uh, a particular law. We also have the principles of equity and general principles of law. So this is applied through the juridical standards of conduct premises on morality, right, and reasoning. So as I was saying to you, um, Civil Code has different books. It's divided so that you in particular, those who are studying Civil Code, can very well organize it. So book one deals with persons and family relations. So book one, uh, persons, because juridical persons such as corporations are likewise referred to in book one, but um, when we refer to family relations, this is where we incorporate already the family code because a lot of chapters found in book one have been amended already by the family code. Um, book uh, two, we have property ownership and its modification. Book three, the different modes of acquiring ownership and how it is being distributed. Uh, this is where you talk about legal heirs, the legitims, those uh, who are, are entitled to receive the estate. And then book four covers um, obligations and contracts. So other parts, preliminary title, this is where our part is, preliminary title. Then we'll go to uh, human relations. Um, part of the human relations is uh, the general principles in dealing with other individuals. Transitional provisions, which is on the later part of the provision of Article 386, and the same with the repealing clause. So some important changes that were introduced. Book one, the elimination of absolute divorce. And there, there is a creation of the judicial or extrajudicial family homes, the insertion of the chapter on human relation, and then there was an abolition on our cultural uh, practice for dowry, or dowry system. Okay. So excuse me. All right. So book two, there are new provisions on the quieting of title. So these are some of the things that you might need to uh, try to look and see how the features of the different provisions of the civil code were uh, being utilized or at least used. Okay, so here, um, as I was telling you, we have a code commission that tried to draft the new civil code or the civil code that we have. The Code Commission was then composed of five members. They were created by then President Manuel Rojas through an executive order. The composition of the commission ha, hindi na ang law mismo because uh, we all know that it was, it's Republic Act 38. Magane? 386. Okay, Republic Act 386. So, 
here. Um, these were the compositions of the original members. Actually, they, they, these are the prominent authors of uh, ano niya, civil, civil law. Um, but then again, uh, sila ni kung baga ang mga nag mga naghimo sa mga libro kag versions nila kag sila nag-author and then they were the ones who have been really focused on anong sa deliberation nila what they intended and why they included this provision and so on so proportions is that the civil code contains 2270 articles 43 of which are completely new provisions so if you have with you a copy of your civil code then if you would read the civil code sa puntas ng civil code may ara na da, may numbers kag may letters or my letter n kung n siya gani which means it's a new provision so that's how you try to show wow amo siya gali this is a new provision later on we'll try to put that so yeah, the language of the civil law is a uh, civil code in as much as it was written in English and the English text is being much utilized. So it means that English should prevail in the interpretation and construction. So the literal English translation of Spain or Latin terms must be interpreted in supplitory and maybe in its original sources. Kung gina refer niya to an old provision, then you look at the old provision and how that old provision was being utilized. And if it's a new one, then how it was being introduced is the one that you would uh, generally follow. So need for a preliminary title, uh, we're setting forth this as the preliminary title. All right, so let's deal with the deep study of civil code. Let's first deal with Article 2. Article 2 states that law shall take effect after 15 days following the completion of their publication in the official gazette unless otherwise provided. This code shall take effect one year after such publication. So if you divide the content of Article 2, Article 2 states in this particular manner that the first provision can be also divided into two concepts. The first line, the first line ranging from the laws shall take effect 15 days following their completion of their publication in the official gazette unless otherwise provided. So the first one is telling you that the general rule is that laws take effect after 15 days. After only 15 days, then the laws can be considered as what effective there's a enforcement to be carried with it next question what if the law in itself would state that upon the signing of the president the law shall be rendered effective then you render it effective because it is it is recognized as such that it should be considered as effective. Now, the second part is actually telling you that the civil code, which is the new civil code, shall take effect one year after such publication. So uh, it was trying to deal with how the effectivity of the civil code will be um, kumbaga, commensurated or marked as to be rendered effective. So the scope of the article of the effectivities of law. So this article provides for the effectivity of two kinds. Here, let's first deal with ordinary law. The ordinary law, as I mentioned, um, it's either that the law in itself has provided the effectivity of the uh, particular law. So question, what if, say for instance, a law does not, um, the law does not state, the law does not here in state uh, the effectivity of the date of its uh, application. But it would render it kumbaga, effective when? 
when would be the law effective? The law is effective immediately. Can it be a valid provision? Well, it is not a valid provision when it's going to claim that it should be effective right away or without need of publication. Because publication, in the case of Tanyada versus Tovera, it states that publication is an indispensable requirement. An indispensable meaning every laws that uh, are intended to be to be effective or be, be made applicable must have kumbaga, that incubation period of what disseminating the information and that is the purpose of publication publication in itself is anchored towards letting the people know through the circulation of uh, notices that these are the contents of the law that is supposed to be uh, rendered enforcing uh, enforceable now um, when you look at the second one effectivity of the civil code. That's what the second part, as I was telling you. Um, the effectivity of the civil code was that it was made more particularly that it shall take effect after such publication. So publication is, would be, uh, publication would usually be defined as what? How do you define publication? Um, in general notion, publicized. Oh, sorry, publicized. Uh, that's the one of the associated term. But um, publication would usually mean the ink, the printing and the distribution of the contents of material therein. But um, in the case of Lara uh, versus Del Rosario, it was actually emphasized that here in the case of Lara versus Del Rosario it was actually emphasized that there must be circulation in order that publication may be warranted to be effective why um, imagine having to go through like this if there is an existing law that you are uh, if there is a law that you intend to to be effective, you try to imprint it to the official gazette or at the same time to a newspaper of general circulation. The challenge therein is that how will you be able to disseminate that material? The act of disseminating what has been printed is called the circulation. So, ang nangyari kasi sa pag-publicize ng civil code is that print out nga nila sa official gazette pero hindi naman nila dinistribute. Tinago lang. So, nainis ang mga legislators and sabi nila, this happened like around June of 1949. And the command of Article 2 is that it will take effect one year after its publication. Take effect one year of such publication. So if you will follow, June pa lang, dapat June 1949 pinablicize. So effectivity niya is June 1950. Kasi that's after 1949, that one year. But it was still made in doubt because the last, the last known distribution of the materials were made on August 30, 1949. That is why it is very important for you in your end to know when was the public, uh, when was the effectivity of the civil code, and when is the effectivity of the family code okay there is a big distinction why because in different instances you would note that ang isa kakasal 
basi ang kasal, ga exist pa siya, kag ang laws ga apply sa iya is still the civil laws or the civil code rather than governed by the family code. So this is very important for you to understand because later on you will eventually make a distinction on whether or not uh, okay, there, there, there is a, a huge difference. Say for instance, marriages that took effect before the application of the family code, the default um, partner, uh, the default property regime, kung baga, kung ano ang klase ng pagmanage ng ilang mga resources and wealth is called conjugal partnership of gains. There is a big distinction after the effectivity of the family code because after the effectivity of the family code, it now set as a default property regime the absolute community. So later on, we will be able to make the distinction what is absolute community, what is conjugal partnership of gains. But that is very much important in how we deal with the effectivity. Okay. So again, we're looking at the provisions here as in the state of which uh, you need to be aware that laws need to be needs to be what publicized before they can be rendered effective article 2 of the civil code has been amended um, through an executive order wherein it widened the scope of not only having it with the official gazette but also including what Newspaper of general circulation. Newspaper of general circulation. Why? Why, sir? Because um, in more cases than one, the newspaper of general circulation has more reach for fit people to actually uh, uh, read what the publication is. So, again, rules that you need to follow is that Article 2, Publication is indispensable. Three, um, the first one is publication is indispensable. The second one is that the there are certain laws that may need not be published. There are certain laws that may need not be published. Um, what are these laws? May, uh, these laws... Uh, may be considered as this one, municipal ordinances. Municipal ordinances need not be published. Um, second one, uh, interpretative laws. Laws that usually just simply uh, provide a deeper or um, expanding or tries to simplify the provision of an existing law does not need to be published. Um, ano pa? There are... Uh, ay, aray na, digali. Later. I set the net up. Okay. So, letters of instructions. Uh, there are instances wherein letters of instructions need not be a per, um, announced. But, uh, say for instance, proclamations which are announcements of special events, uh, they usually uh, have kumbaga, important notion for publication. Okay? So, here. Effectivity of an ordinary law. An ordinary law usually takes effect when the law in itself provides a date on when it shall be effective. Say, for instance, the law shall be effective uh, on... Uh, it states there, like your anta... Wait. You remember the recent law about the child safety of in motor vehicles? It actually says that the law shall be effective 
two, two years after. So it's actually, this is the second year, 2021, because it was then signed two years after the signing of the law. Okay, so it was, um, well, the intention was that it's supposed to disseminate more awareness and information about this particular law. So when the law in itself expressly provides when it shall take effect, then you follow that. If there is no such expression on when it shall be made effective, then you follow the 15-day rule. Okay? It should be after 15 days. When is the 15th days? You you count the 15 days from the completion of the publication. Even some of the law students get to, uh, ano eh, uh, lawyers, confused pa na. They say 15 days uh, upon publication. Wrong. Because 15 days after the completion of the publication. Meaning, kung yung publish mo sa February 1, sigi-sigi mo siya publish until February 15, the last day of February 15 would be the date of the completion of the publication. So that would be your basis therein. All right. So, um, when no publication is needed, where a law provides for its own effectivity, such as, for example, again, that was already given the example. Here. Please take note, publication is... Yeah, then again, one minute. Take a go. All right, sorry. So when publication is needed, unless otherwise provided by the law after 15 days. This is enshrined in the case of Tanyada versus Tovera. So uh, publication must be in full because if it is not fully made publicized, then it defeats the purpose of trying to publish the law. Okay, so again, there is this administrative uh, code back then, so it's the begin uh, when it said there um, in relation to in relation to the effectivity of the beginning of the fifteenth day after the completion, then it can be a simple mathematical counting. So it may not be. Uh, No, that's good. that's good. Tomate. Rule applicable to certain circulars, but not all. Okay? Gracious ang hand niya. Yeah. Hindi siya Ano ka? Ah. Shit mo nang. Ha. Sinja, I have a lot of dogs in my house. Shit. Okay. Other ones. So let's just try to read on what about rules relating to administrative rules then um, it's still required. May ara siya being mga requirements are, there are instances wherein, what are those laws 
that do not need to be published. Again, municipal ordinances, interpretative laws, laws of local application, um, laws that nothing more that uh, instructional in nature, they do not need to be published. Sige. So date of effectivity, this is what I was telling you earlier, the case of Lara versus Del Rosario, because um, there was this concern that you have published it, but you did not even made the effort to circulate it. So uh, instead of having it on June 1949, they placed it on August 30, which is the last date after the year of the publication of the said item. Okay. So this is the case of Lara versus the Rosario. Uh, ano ni siya? Here, there's this specific case, uh, the summary of it, is that the plaintiffs were former taxi drivers of the defendant. When the latter sold some of his vehicles, the plaintiff who were no longer needed uh, were dismissed because of their employer did not give them their one month salary in lieu of the notice required under the commercial code. So the action is instituted. Here, they were trying to ask, saan o nag bala naging effective ang new civil code? So it was the service of the plaintiffs ended on September 4, 1960. Then it would be noted that August 30 was the effectivity of the new civil code. And in the new civil code, there were already distinctions as to how one should receive his separation pay. And it is not just uh, um, the computation. It had to deal with the severance package of the one month thing. Okay. All right, so let's go to Article 3. Article 3 is states ignorance of the loan excuses no one from compliance therewith. So this is one of the most famous legal maxims that we have. It is ignorantia lehis neminem excusat. So, or others would say ignorantia lehis non excusat, meaning the ignorance of the law would excuse no one. There is this existence based on um, Latin jurisprudence. I'm sorry, Roman law jurisprudence, wherein imagine if you get to be apprehended and you get to be caught. The idea there is that one can easily put as a defense that he is simply ignorance, ignorant to an existence of a law. Therefore, he should be excused. So, pareho sina, nadakpan ka. Wala ka kabalo, ngay bawal gali, ang amuni nga himuon yung. So, when you get caught, you're just simply going to say, I do not know the law. So, how ridiculous would that be? And that's why, ang Article 3 should be connected to Article 2, meaning that publication is an indispensable requirement because publication would then create the presumption that you have acquired enough knowledge to know that a law is actually being utilized or a law is being used. Okay, so that's how important uh, for you to consider this kind of uh, provision. So, um, ignorance of the law also in its applicability is only limited to domestic laws, right? You are not required to know the foreign laws that are existing. Why? Because again, that is not part of the jurisprudence or not is not part of the application or the extent of the application of the law. Foreign laws are applicable only to their laws, to the laws of which the subject is limited to the territory where that's, that state or that foreign law exists. So the importance, if for instance, you would hear that the law that is being violated is a foreign law, then you can invoke there is what we call ignorance of a fact, okay? Um, 
there is what we call the concept of facts versus laws. When you're considering laws, you have no excuse. The laws or the domestic laws that we have is something that compels you to be aware and know of. That's why kung dakpon ka gani sa LTO, hanggang balon ka nga, ay sorry, wala kayo kabalo sinan nga. Ay, okay lang na, sir. Ah. Pero violate ka gagyapon. So you cannot run, ex- run yourself excuse if you are not fully aware of the existence of this law. But it would be different if there is what we call a more distinctive feature wherein that particular law was never publicized. Okay? Now, things you need to understand with um, uh, ignorance of law versus ignorance of fact. Ignorance of fact is something that excuses you from certain liabilities. Uh, it may be that you may not have the factual appreciation of a particular a particular incident or a particular event, but it should not be in particularly related to the law. Anong ginamihin mo sina? Okay. Uh, I take back to the case of uh, uh, U.S. versus Ang, wherein this individual was sleeping in his quarters. In the sleeping of his quarters, somebody was trying to open his door. And somebody tried to open his door. It was around midnight. So he tried to tell, um, who is that? Who is this person knocking? No response. And then he informed once again that if you would enter here, I will stab you. Okay? When this person forced his way in inside, Acho was uh, executing uh, the stabbing of this intruder. He was able to stab the intruder but he then later on realized that this in person who he considered as intruder was nothing more but his roommate in the room. Here, for the first time, the Supreme Court made it clear that he should not be held liable because he was ignorant of the fact that the person intruding was his roommate. Because he made warnings. Eh. So ignorance of the fact is something that may excuse you from certain liabilities. Okay, But that's more in related to criminal law. All right. So applicability of the maxim, again, it applies to domestic laws. Thus, the laws of Texas uh, as to their succession rights on how you get to inherit, these are totally different from how we are going to apply. The laws in the different country is something that we do not uh, appreciate. Say for instance, um, nagpakasal ka somewhere abroad. Actually, different na siya eh. Ah, sige lang. Isang sample lang eh. When you got married there, you were not fully aware that marriage there would require you to actually execute some other form of document and some other form of uh, ano siya, prerequisite in order to get married. But as long as you believe that when you got married, you were able to say your vow, you were able to set uh, your witnesses, you were able to set uh, the formal requisites that was very much needed. And, uh, and in doing so, you have very in itself followed the, uh, baga, the applicability of our own laws. Actually, we have what we call the doctrine of processual presumption. Um, if the laws of the country is not made known to you or is not made known to the jurisdiction of our courts, what usually happens is that our courts will assume that the laws of the foreign country is the same with our domestic laws. That is the doctrine of processual presumption. But 
these are usually invoked in instances of what? Instances of uh, uh, separation, annulment, and divorce. So when you go to court here, invoking that uh, your partner has already filed uh, divorce, you our courts will not easily um, adopt the doctrine of processual presumption but rather one should actually prove first that there is a law in that foreign state to which whoever is your spouse was able to avail of or that law is entitling him to actually do that particular act okay so again so this is those are some of the issues that you need to be aware of under um, Article 3. When we say again, ignorance of law, we refer not only to the literal words of the law itself, but also the meaning and their interpretation and how they are being applied in our courts of justice. Uh, here, as I was telling to you, the mistake of fact and ignorance of law needs to be distinguished. When you say ignorance of law will not excuse anyone, no excuse shall be made in its compliance. Whereas when you are ignorant of a particular fact, it eliminates criminal intent. Or there is what we call absence of negligence. Say for instance, uh, because this is in relation to family law here. Huh? Thus, when a man marries his second wife, upon reason and believing that his original wife was already missing for 10 years, one cannot claim that he is guilty of bigamy because he truly believed that his wife who has abandoned him or has been dead by reason of an accident in the voyage of a ship has been missing for more than 10 years he would make the assumption that that person is already dead. Thereby, if the wife reoccurs or nagpalapit liwat, then he would discover that the wife was never dead at the first place, pero uh, buhi pa, he can claim that he is not liable for bigamy by the same reason that it is not a mistake of law or not a not an ignorance of law, but the ignorance or the mistake of fact that he was not able to establish the death of his first wife or that the first wife was then still alive. Okay? So this is in con correlation to Article 41. A marriage contracted by any person during the subsistence of a previous marriage, meaning first marriage, kung ga exist pa ang first marriage, and then subsequently nagpakasal siya ang iyang uh, um ta, ang first marriage niya is null and void so again just i'll just like to read the provision on article 41 a marriage contracted by any person during the subsistence of a previous marriage shall be null and void unless before the celebration of the subsequent marriage the prior spouse has been absent for four consecutive years and the spouse present had a well-founded belief, well-founded belief that the absent spouse was already dead. In case of disappearances where there is danger or death under circumstances set forth in Article 391 of the Civil Code, an absence of only two years shall be sufficient. Again, Marriage contracted by any person during the subsistence of a previous marriage shall be null and void. In simple terms, ha, kung nagpakasal kaliwat, nga exist pa ang imong first marriage, ang imong subsequent marriage will be null and void. But if before ka nagpakasal sa ang imong nga ikaduwa nga marriage, ang imong nga prior nga spouse or ang imo nga first nga husband man na or first nga wife mo was absent already for four consecutive years and that you had a well-founded belief that the absent spouse is already dead, then you are allowed 
to consider and assume that that person is already considered as dead. Okay? Alright. So, basi may mga intenda sa inyo nga patyon yung ano yung inyo nga first wife bago ka mo mapakasal sa inyo nga second wife. Abi pagwaan yung mga do aksidente. Pati, no, no. Don't do that, please. Um, well, kung hindi magigam mo para sa isa at isa, isa te, quits na lang. Good luck for the memories. Doon mo lang nabi. Alright? Sige. So, for the purpose of contracting a subsequent marriage, ha? The spouse must institute a proceeding as provided for in the declaration of presumptive absence without prejudice to the reappearance of the absent spouse. This is actually one of those instances nga gina shortcut nila ang instance for the nullity of their marriage. Um, so for instance, 10 years na kami wala gaop the nai ni ano, amon sa mga tulfo nga mga Asturian I love. Nga uh, Mr. Tulfo, inireklamo ko po ang aking missis kasi nagpakasal na daw siya sa iba. Ha? Paano mo nalaban? Eh, nabalitaan ko na lang po na meron na siyang iba. Uh, tapos tawag ko na yun si missis. Eh, missis, ba't ka naman nagpakasal sa bago mong kinakasama? Eh, kasi po, sampung taon na yan na hindi nagpaparandam sa amin. Hindi na siya nagpapadala ng pira. Wala na siyang pakialam sa kanyang mga anak. Hindi ko alam kung anong nangyari sa kanya. Nagulat nga ako. Mabuhay pa ang demonyo niyan. Uh, tapos mamba na yun si Tulfo. Ah, ganun naman pala mister. Wala ka palang sabi-sabi kung buhay ka pa or ano. Uh, so what would be the consequence of that? Usually, number one, um, to, to formalize the death of the presumptive death. Okay, the term is presumptive death. To formalize the presumptive death of your first spouse, you need to make a declaration that he is dead. A certificate of the declaration of his presumptive death of the absentee spouse is needed. Okay? Then, sa certificate na da, may ara na dagamay nga provision. This is without prejudice to the reappearance of the absent spouse. Oh. So, syempre, si Tulfo, tawag niya na dayon ang iyang favorite nga lawyer. Attorney, dayari tungol. Oh, attorney, amo to nangyari? Oh, explain mo na dayon ni attorney Garrett. Oh, so, ang mangyayari dito, attorney, is that baliwala na ang pangalawang kasal niya. Opo. Pwede bang kasuhan si Mrs. ng bigamous marriage or bigamy? Uh, what is bigamy? Bigamy is committed when one person marries the second time around while his first marriage is existing. So, when he does that, he eventually incurs criminal liability. Hindi pa na pa dissolve ang first marriage, nagpakasal ka na sa second mo na marriage. Oh. So anong nangyari? He will be held liable. But here, there is what we call an instance of ignorance of fact. Please take note. It can, she can validly invoke there was an ignorance of fact. I was here making an assumption that 10 years have lapsed. My husband has never communicated to me. My husband has never told me where he is and what he has done and what his whole lifetime is. Therefore, I have my needs as a wife and a woman. I only fell in love with this amazing guy. Oh, see? Naging rason niya pa ang laki. Oh. So something like that. Please, pa lang actually sa ignorance of the law. But please allow yourselves to uh, make this uh, notion that ignorance of the law excuses no one. Please, please. So ignorance of the law is part of what? The basis of good faith. So the code specifically provides that a mistake on a doubtful, difficult question of law may be a basis of good faith. So, however, one does not excuse because of such ignorance. One would continue to be liable. Okay? One will continue to be liable in this particular fact. So, 
Um, next is Article 4. Law should have no retroactive effect unless contrary is provided. All right. So the general rule is that laws shall have prospective effect. The general rule is that laws are applied prospectively. What are the exceptions? There are actually numerous exceptions to this. Numerous exceptions would even echoed uh, when the law in itself provides for a retroactivity. So the general rule, prospective, but if the law in itself provides for its effectivity. Uh, here, I would like to share. Okay. Uh, sorry. I actually created your uh, initiative. initial the cheat code but i'll give this to you uh after na. i'll post it okay there are non-retroactive laws general rule laws have no retroactive effect except when the law in itself provides for it when the law is curative meaning it tries to remedy a certain defect of an old law if the law is interpretative just like the same with what was uh, issued about uh, publication when the law is procedural or remedial in nature when the law is for emergency, when there is a law that creates new rights, and then there are tax laws, these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, these things require what? It doesn't, it doesn't need to be prohibited for its retroactivity. Meaning to say, these laws can be applied retroactively. Exception to the exception. Meaning to say, maski maghambal siya, nga, pwede na siya, pero bawal gidna siya. Ya. Here, laws under your constitution, ex post facto laws. What are ex post facto law? You still remember your ex post facto law? One which would render an act, what? Guilty. Or criminally be held liable before anything or everything that is being made. After the fact has been done. So, you cannot have a retroactive effect on that. Another one are laws that impair your obligations and contract. Say for instance, um, are, there is what we call, kilala niyo si Robin Padilla. Uh, before si Robin Padilla, nadakop. Nadakpa na si Robin Padilla. When Robin Padilla was arrested, he was imprisoned. And when he was imprisoned back then, when he was imprisoned back then, Robin Padilla was actually sentenced for a certain number of time. But because maninoy niya si Ramon Revilla Sr. Yes, uh, illegal possession. Dami kayo makita nyo ang ano. Ah. Yan. Sintensya. This was in 1994. Taong 1994, 21 taong pagkakabilanggo si Robin Padilla sa kasong illegal possession of high-powered firearms. Nakulong siya sa New Believed Prison sa loob ng tatlong taong. Ngunit naka... 
Ah. Ngunit, earlier siya nakagwa because Ramon Revilla Sr. created a new law which shortened the penalty for illegal possession. Therefore, laws, di ba lagi na? Laws cannot be applied retroactively. But when it is favorable to the accused, then you can apply it retroactively. Because that takes into form of a curative law. Kumbaga, it allows this certain provision to be relaxed. Kaya rin noong taong 1998 nang mabigyan siya ng conditional pardon ni Nooy Pangulong Fidel Ramos. Nito lamang Agosto, kabilang si Padilla sa mga inirekomenda ng Board of Pardons and Parole para sa executive clemency. Isa si Robin Padilla. Hala, sige. I'm just using him as an example to the very definition of what you can actually get from a prospective application of laws. Okay? So, laws shall be have prospective effects. Never forget that. Alright, it's 7.30. You still have a class, right? Okay, so okay. I'll I'll dismiss you. We'll continue on Wednesday, please. I still attorney. have a discussion on Wednesday. Oh, my Hello, God. attorney. Yes, yes. Okay. On Wednesday we have recollection. We don't know the time yet, so maybe. But we they said that we are excused for all of our class during Wednesday. Okay, we'll meet each other. I'll post the materials and everything in discussion. No, because just try to stay. I we may not meet on Wednesday, so I'll give you that. I cannot force you because the recollection is recollection. So I cannot also meet you on a Friday because that's for your mental health. So apparently, the next time we would meet, I do not know when, but it may be on Monday, pa. Please do study because that would the next time we meet definitely you will have an available quiz to answer, okay? That would cover from the very start until Article 10, right? So leave Jesus in our hearts forever. Thank you, Attorney. Thank you, Attorney. Thank you, Attorney. Bingo.